Hello and welcome to a new episode of PHI Public Health Impact. I'm Cham Dallas. And I'm Phaedra Corso. We're kicking off our fourth season of PHI and we're broadcasting today from the Georgia Power Room in the newly renovated Rhodes Hall on the University of Georgia's Health Science Campus. You know, the College of Public Health has moved its administrative headquarters from the Paul D. Coverdale Building on the South Campus to the new Health Sciences Campus here on Prince Avenue just last October. Rhodes Hall now serves as the new home of the Dean's Office, including the Office of Academic Affairs, Research, and Outreach and Engagement. And so these groups now join the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology and the Center of Global Health, which are all here on the former U.S. Navy School site. Well, Phaedra, today we're going to talk about the continuing impact of HIV AIDS, uh, particularly in the United States. You know, Cham, it's been 30 years, it's such a long time, since the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention identified the first case of AIDS in the United States. And so since that time, there have been many advancements in the prevention and treatment of AIDS and HIV. Just because people don't hear about HIV AIDS anymore, it, it, they have the impression that it's kind of gone away. That is definitely not the case. Uh, the CDC now estimates that over a million people have active HIV AIDS infections uh, walking around today. As many as 20% of them don't even know it. So that's what we'll be talking about today. We'll be hearing from researchers from the University of Georgia's College of Public Health to learn about what they're doing to prevent HIV AIDS. Now we have with us Dr. Nathan Hansen, head of the Department of Health Promotion Behavior at the University of Georgia College of Public Health. And Dr. Hansen's gonna give us the overview of where we've been and where we're going with HIV AIDS. You know, I was a graduate student, young, uh, assistant professor when this all started 30 years ago. Um, what was so startling for you about this initial HIV AIDS epidemic when it started in uh, approximately early 80s? Well, you know, it was a scary disease. No one really knew what it was. No one knew what, where it came from. People were afraid. People were afraid to use the bathroom, use public restrooms. People didn't know how it was spread. People knew once they found out it was a bloodborne illness, people were afraid to help people who were bleeding. Yeah. There's a lot of fear around that. You know? And I, I remember when Magic Johnson was diagnosed in 1991, yeah. that was a big deal because suddenly there's someone who's of prominence who's, who's living with HIV. Um, myself, I, I worked a lot with substance use. And you know, I, I, the first research I did with HIV was around bereavement and dying. And uh, you know, with, with antiretrovirals that came out in the, the mid 1990s it's, we started to have treatment and people started to live longer so it's interesting within about 10 years of my starting my research career i'm now researching aging people living with hiv rather than dying with hiv so it's, it's been a really interesting transition for me well that's a progression you know a lot of disease or research uh progressions don't advance as well or you don't see the um the, the changes and the dramatic uh, successes that you would hear um, what is, in that line, what has been the most significant accomplishments in the HIV AIDS uh, research? Well, the, I mean, obviously the, the most significant accomplishment is antiretroviral medication, you know, that, that actually blocks the replication of, of the virus. And that allows people to live longer. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is we don't hear about people dying of AIDS because people don't die from AIDS-related causes very often anymore. But people with HIV still die in large numbers. Uh, because they're dying of other things. You know, HIV affects your immune system and, and you know, your body systems kind of just break down over time. So people are dying of cancers. People are dying of other types of, of diseases and infection. Liver cancer and hepatitis C is a big cause of death. Lung cancer from smoking. Uh, so we're, we're still seeing people dying in large numbers. Uh, but antiretrovirals and another big advance has been needle exchange. You know, one of the, the most efficient routes of transmission, inject it right into your vein. Well, if, if people have clean needles and, and are injecting drugs safely, that's one of the biggest successes we've had is, is reducing the rates of HIV infection among injection drug users. Well, Dr. Hansen, the, uh, the populations that are acquiring this uh, disease uh, have really changed over time, uh, especially from where it was 30 years ago to where it is today. Yeah, so I, you know, as I mentioned, injection drug use used to be one of the, the big routes of infection, mm -hmm. and it, it's less so now. Uh, you know, men who have sex with men are, are continuing to be one of the highest uh, groups affected by HIV, 
Um, but we are seeing a lot more heterosexual spread mm -hmm. of HIV as well. And this is a disease that changes uh, over time in view of age, not just the groups you just mentioned, but the fact that uh, it's really not showing up as much among the younger populations like it was. Well, I mean, it depends on how you define younger, but, but what yeah. we are seeing is that with successful treatment, mm -hmm. particularly with pregnant women, we are not seeing uh, mm -hmm. pediatric AIDS in this country very often. You know, in fact, I know of, of a lot of, of pediatric AIDS clinics that have graduated their patients on the adult clinic and closed shop, which is a great success. Uh, people are living longer, and we are doing a good job of preventing mother-to-child transmission. Well, so, so <laughs> what we're seeing now, then, is just as uh, in the United States, certainly, and in other countries, we see an aging population. The proportion of people that are quite a bit older is really expanding. The same thing is occurring simultaneously or parallel with the HIV AIDS population. Yes, absolutely. You know, and just thinking locally here in Georgia, you know, we, we have the fifth highest number of, of new infections, the fifth highest number of people living with HIV, with over 40,000 people in the state living with HIV, about one in 100 people living with mm -hmm. HIV in Georgia. And what we're seeing is people still get affected, about 2,500 people a year, but people aren't dying. So the number of people living with HIV is really growing as people age. So what is the role of public health in the prevention and the control of HIV AIDS? So there's two things that I think that are really important to, to do for people living with HIV. And the first one is people need to take their medication. Uh, if people have their viral load controlled, you know, the, the amount of HIV virus that's in their bloodstream, they're much less likely to transmit the infection. So people who have HIV need to know, they need to get tested, they need to find out they have it, they need to get into care, and they need to get on medication and, and be adherent. We, we know people have to take you know, a high dose, or at least be adherent to what they're, they're prescribed at high levels in order to control the virus. So that is, that's hugely important, and it's tough to do. And so as public health practitioners, we can help people with finding out how do we go out and find people and get them tested, how do we help to get them into care, and how do we help them to stay on their medication. I mean, those are all problems that, that we have that will help to reduce transmission. And the other is sexual safety. You know, we've done a good job with needle exchange in, in places that have it, getting clean needles to injectors to, to prevent the transmission. But sexual safety, sex education, using condoms is important, particularly where people don't know they have the infection. Yeah, well, there's been a lot of progress in that particular arena. I mean, there, that's something we can quantify and show that uh, changes in behavior have resulted in a real change in outcome. It, you know, and these are things that are, that are challenging to do, you know, to, to change people's behavior. Uh, but, but it's doable, and we have a lot of success in doing that, you know. And, uh, so I do think that, first of all, policy-level things, you know, having people who are in charge of, of the laws, the systems that, that we live under, being more open to sex education at an earlier age, um, and being, doing things like expanding needle exchange so that people who are going to use drugs until there's good treatments available, then you know, let them have safe injections so that they at least don't infect other people and keep themselves healthy. Um, you know, what are the remaining challenges that you see uh, for researchers? Uh, uh, you know, you're researching in this area and you know the researchers really well. Uh, what, 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 where, what's the future look like? What's the horizon look like? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of areas that still need a lot of work with HIV and stigma, of course, being one and how, how to help people to, to be more comfortable with themselves and how to help the community treat people better. Uh, those, are, those are big challenges, uh, really helping people to be more adherent to their, their medication. And you know, th there's one area that you know, when we talk about pediatrics and, and you know, young people who, with HIV who've, who've moved along through and they're now reaching adulthood with HIV, uh, the, the group that we don't talk about as much is the people who are affected by HIV, the children of parents who have HIV. Um, if, you, if you're a kid living with HIV, it's pretty easy to get care. If you're a kid whose parents have HIV, you get left out. People don't necessarily notice you. They don't worry about how you feel, what's going on with your health, because they're worrying about the parents, and so are the kids. You know what I mean? So, so these, this is a group that, that doesn't get enough attention. No, that's a different form of morbidity that, that people uh, miss. You know, mental health issues are huge in this country and growing, um, yeah. even more so among the, uh, those affected by HIV. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, for your insights into where AIDS has been, where HIV AIDS is going, and, uh, 
and quite frankly, the tremendous amount of progress that's been made. Thank you very much. Thanks for Now we're going to talk with Nalana Wolfork, who is a Doctor of Public Health candidate here in the University of Georgia College of Public Health, has a Master's of Public Health already, and we're going to be talking about the National HIV AIDS Strategy. Uh, Nalana, first of all, uh, we hear a lot uh, from the government, from the White House, about the National HIV AIDS Strategy. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Yes, well, Cham, the National HIV AIDS Strategy is a coordinated national response to the HIV AIDS epidemic in the United States. Okay, well, what, what are the three goals that we hear about from this? Well, the first is to reduce the number of new HIV infections. The second is to increase access to care for those who are currently living with HIV. And the third is to reduce HIV-related health disparities. So, now, how many people that are actually living uh, with HIV, AIDS, uh, are not in care? Actually, about a third of people living with HIV currently are not in care in the United States. Well, that, that's, that's huge. I mean, yes. that, that's huge. In public health, we want to prevent disease. Um, and we want to treat. Uh, how, can you explain this HIV treatment cascade in simple terms so we can understand how this works? Yes, well, actually, for those who uh, are infected, in terms of diagnosis, it's a very high number. It's usually about 80 to 100% of those who are infected go to a testing site and, or a clinic and get diagnosed. However, what we tend to see is that once they get linked into care, the numbers decrease to about 50%. Then from that point of retention in care and even staying on antiretroviral medicine, the number decreases dramatically to about 30%. Wow, so they know they have it, but they don't engage in care. Correct. But why does this phenomenon occur? Well, there are various reasons. Depending on the person's financial situation, the cost of antiretroviral therapy can be quite high. Also, if the person is over the age of 50 or even 60, they may have other complex comorbidities such as high blood pressure or diabetes that might interfere with their care. And also, there's a challenge with when someone presents, can that healthcare system support them if they need HIV care amongst other illnesses? So what are the benefits, then, of this early engagement of care that we're missing for a lot of people for HIV AIDS? Well, for the individual, if they start care early enough, uh, their viral load will be suppressed. In addition, uh, they have better immunologic outcomes just for their entire body. As we know, HIV, which may progress to AIDS, there's a, their immune system may be compromised, and also there's lower mortality. But from a public health perspective, if the person is actually treated early, they can decrease their risky behaviors, and also they're less likely to transmit the virus to others. Well, well thank you, Nilana. I really appreciate you sharing uh, this uh, research uh, that you're doing, uh, and it's been going on here at the College of Public Health, and it's going on across the nation in uh, pushing forward uh, this prevention of disease uh, as well as treatment. Thank you. Now we're going to talk to Dr. Timothy Heckman, the Associate Dean of Research here at the University of Georgia College of Public Health. We're going to talk about AIDS, HIV AIDS, in older adults. Uh, Dr. Heckman, can you tell us about these new emerging populations of older adults with HIV? Sure. The, uh, here in the United States, we have what we call the graying of the epidemic in, in HIV. People are living longer with HIV, primarily due to better HIV medications, antiretrovirals, which are the, the medicines that people living with HIV take to minimize the replication of the virus and to improve their immune system. So we're, we're clearly seeing a graying of the epidemic. In fact, uh, currently about 35 percent of all people living with HIV in the United States are over age 50, mm -hmm. but by 2015 we expect that that number will increase to 50 percent. So in just a few years, one out of two people living with HIV here in the U.S will be 50 or older. Well, what are the unique risk factors that you see for older adults with HIV AIDS? Well, I think what's most unique about uh, older adults being at risk for HIV is that unlike some populations, particularly early in the epidemic, you know, multiple sexual partners, anonymous sexual partners, 
was, was really driving the epidemic. But what we tend to see with older adults is that very few have multiple sexual partners. They often have maybe one or two over a period of time. It's just that they didn't really know the history of that partner. And so they don't realize that he or she was a former injection drug user or bisexual. And so they, they, they get exposed to HIV not through multiple partners, but just by having one or two partners who've had risky histories. Are, are there any particular clinical issues that, that face older adults with HIV AIDS? Sure, I think the one that's receiving the most attention today is the large number of comorbid health conditions mm -hmm. with which HIV infected people are living. You know, a lot of people, older adults, in addition to living with their HIV, are living with hepatitis, uh, mild liver disease, osteoarthritis, headache disorders, things like that. And it really complicates their treatment and reduces their quality of life. But we're, we're really concerned about the, the large number of other health conditions they're living with and the issue of premature aging. It was, it's very interesting. They, they took a group of, of HIV-infected men and their mean age was 55 years. And they compared them to non-infected people, older people. And they found that the, the group of HIV-infected men who had a mean age of 55 years had the same number of comorbid health conditions as the HIV seronegative group that had a mean age of 70 years. So there's almost 15 years of premature aging mm. in that group. And it's probably due to HIV, but also some of the treatments. There's a lot of concern about are these new medications, sure, they're keeping people alive, but, but are, they, are they leading to liver disease? And are they you know, prematurely aging uh, people living with HIV? So there's a, there's a large number of, of clinical concerns. You know, we see a lot of depression and anxiety. Rates of depression in HIV-infected older adults may be as high as 50%. Rates of anxiety, about 20%. Uh, suicidal ideation is high in a large number. So both in terms of physical well-being and mental health well-being, there's a lot of things that, that we're really concerned about with this group. So it might be an oversimplification, but basically you're talking about 15 years, basically, coming off these sure. people's lives. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, at least. In fact, yeah. it, even today, uh, with as with advanced as we are in terms of clinical care, if a 20-year-old person with HIV started to take antiretrovirals, uh, that person would still be expected to lose about one-third of their life expectancy yeah. compared to, to non-negative people. But still better than dying, of course. Yes, yeah, sure. yeah. oh, I mean, yeah. we've made, yeah. you know, right. we've made remarkable progress yeah. over the past 20 or 30 years. Right. You know? In fact, there's, uh, the CDC has a, a nice slide showing that back in the, the 80s, the mm -hmm. mid-80s, um, most people who died of HIV were about 35, 36 mm -hmm. years of age. But now here, you know, 2009, 2010, when a person dies from HIV, they're usually around 50, 55 years of age. So the, the, the progress that they've made in terms of being yeah. able to extend life expectancies has been remarkable. But we're equally concerned about improving life quality of well, not just life expectancy. Well, this whole age-related phenomenon, it's sliding upward then. The, right. the number, the mean, I guess, uh, where people have... Uh, HIV AIDS, that age is sliding steadily upward. I mean, the population's aging as well, but sure. the, the, the age at which people, the mean age of people is really going to be, is moving up, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah. A lot of people say that if a person with HIV is in care and retained in care and they're on antiretrovirals and, and they're getting health care like they should, that person, a lot of those people can have life expectancies that are comparable to HIV seronegative people. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of ifs in that statement, if they're in care, if they're on antiretrovirals, if they're adhering to, to the antiretrovirals. So under best case scenario, people with HIV can live what might be considered normal life expectancies, but there's a lot of, a lot of factors that play into that. And you know that's not always true for everybody. Well, to conclude, what, what are the obstacles and unique challenges for treatment adherence uh, for older adults with HIV AIDS here in the United States? Sure. Um, I think one thing that's been pretty consistent in, in the research to date is that t to some people's surprises, HIV adherence among older adults has been, has been quite good. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon to see rates of adherence, you know, 80, 90 percent, which is really what you need. Uh, I think part of the complication is that in addition to taking HIV medications, they're taking medications for a whole host of issues. Yeah. They might be taking multivitamins, but they might be taking an anti-cholesterol agent or medications for, for other 
for other conditions. And so, you know, it's just kind of taking that HIV medication consistently in addition to all the other medications, which could have a lot of different types of interactions or, or side effects. But, um, you know, it's not, it's not always easy to, to adhere consistently to these, to these medications. But I think part of the good news is that a large number of HIV-infected older adults all are adhering. It's just that what we need to do is identify that subgroup that's having difficulty and then develop interventions and programs for, for them to help them adhere better to these medications. Well, thank you, Dr. Heckman. I, uh, I understand a lot better now, I can tell you, uh, about this. The epidemic continues, but it's aging just like the rest of the population. Thank you very much. Sure, my pleasure. Let's turn our attention now to the College of Public Health's partnership with AIDS Athens. This is an effort to bring awareness about HIV AIDS to the local community. The faculty, staff, the students, researchers work together with the local community to raise money, awareness about this continuing epidemic. Today is our annual AIDS walk where people come around from the community and come together and walk to raise money for HIV and AIDS, spread awareness about the disease and the impact in our area, as well as kind of fight the stigma and discrimination by making a public display of their support of people who have the disease. The walk actually started several years back. In 2009, a couple of students at the University of Georgia decided to make a nonprofit organization dedicated to an AIDS walk. And uh, one of those students was a member of our college. And so she got the graduate students to get involved in putting on the very first AIDS walk in town. And that was in 2009. And so in 2010, it got rained out. And then we went on a year hiatus. And so we decided to reinvigorate the AIDS walk after having gone on a couple of years hiatus. I'm actually on the AIDS Walk Committee, so we've been working on this since January, trying to figure out all the logistics. There's a lot to go through. You have to get the city permit, you have to hire police for the event, you have to plan the walk route and get it approved, and then get all these donations and get everybody together, and that was most important. With this collaboration, this is what really made the walk happen. All that money will go towards prevention and testing and, and help people who are already living with HIV and AIDS. As well as the event is really about spreading awareness of the disease so people in the community um, know that it's still a problem. But it also, I think to me, it's very important about ending stigma and discrimination. It's very real. Our clients still lose jobs, family members. Um, you know, they're afraid to tell family members and loved ones that they have the disease. So it is about just showing support. A lot of our clients are walking here today. Um, and I think it's really good for them to see, because a lot of times when people, people who have HIV and AIDS, they also have self-inflicted stigma for how they came about the disease and, and the way society has made them feel about being HIV positive. So it's a very emotional day for those clients as well. My biggest passion with health promotion behavior is HIV prevention and AIDS. So um, when I first moved to Athens, I thought AIDS Athens it's a great organization that helps the community and it helps people with who are HIV positive, their families, and it also works with prevention. Um, so I thought, you know, what better way to help them out because they help so many other people out in our Northeast Georgia communities. The College of Public Health has been involved. They're the, the biggest sponsor of the walk, as well as the Student um, Public Health Association. And those kids are the ones who have been helping from everything, from coffee and bagels to route preps to the permit to even have an event on campus. So, I mean, we would have never been able to pull something like this off with, without the College of Public Health and, and recruiting team members and visiting fraternities and sororities and local businesses about having teams. So, I mean, it's I was so happy when the public health school opened in Athens because for, you know, AIDS Athens has been around for 26 years, but we've been fighting this disease by ourselves in this community for a large part of that. So when the public health school opened here, it was, I mean, it was almost like a dream come true because now we are not alone and we have the support of so many public health professionals and there's so many professors at that school that have a specialty in HIV and AIDS. And, and if you don't know, we still don't have an infectious disease doctor in the 10 counties that we serve. So, I mean, this is just the one step, a huge step to really making a difference in this community. I think that anyone who comes to the University of Georgia and doesn't feel committed to doing something in this community, in a small town where the college students are such a huge integral part of this town. If you don't feel committed to doing something positive in this community, then 
you know, it's a sad life. So that, to me, that, that's the most important thing. It's feeling a sense of altruism, feeling a sense of connectedness to such a small town, um, and just wanting to do something positive, something good and meaningful. Yeah. AIDS Watch 2013, woo! For the AIDS Walk this year, more than 300 people participated, raising $23,000. That's really fantastic. Yeah, and Phaedra, I'd like to thank all the guests that came today and spoke to us about this continuing epidemic here in the United States of HIV AIDS. And we'd like to thank you for watching PHI Public Health Impact, where we'll be tackling some other very important public health topics this season. We'll see you next time on PHI Public Health Impact. <laughs>